Fracking requires roughly 5.7 million gallons of water per well, water that can be used for irrigation and human consumption. Apply that figure to the additional 930 wells that have been permitted since 2010, and you can see how this will severely impact the water supply in Louisiana. The water is combined with chemicals, sand, and gel-type lubricants that are then injected under pressure of about 1,500 PSI into the well bore. Since the fluids used in fracking are a trade secret, the oil and gas producers are not required to inform the people what they are pumping into the ground. And thanks to the Halliburton loophole, fracking processes including chemicals they're injecting into the ground and the wastewater byproduct coming out of the ground are exempt from the Safe Water Drinking Act of 1974, as well as from EPA regulations under Subtitle C of the Energy Policy Act of 2005, or the Halliburton Loophole. It is important to note that due to the depths of these wells, some of them in excess of one mile, the well bores must pass through aquifers or clean water tables and a fraccident or fracturing accident of one of these well bores could result in the contamination of entire aquifers thus decimating an entire water resource for plants, livestock and human consumption in a particular area or region. In addition to the carcinogenic chemicals, including benzene and toluene, recovered from independent testing of water from these wells, high levels of radioactive material releases, specifically radium and uranium, have also been identified in and around fracking locations. In many instances, these levels range from 250 to over 1,500 times the federal limit for environmental release. And what is, the AP, what is the EPA or NRC saying on this matter? Absolutely nothing. So, what are they doing with all this wastewater being created? Well, in some cases, it's being hauled off to local sewage treatment plants, which were never designed to handle level 1 VOCs or radioactive materials. In addition, at roughly 6 million gallons, of water per well, and let's just look at the 930 w additional wells for now and disregard the 1,000 plus wells already in production, you're looking at about 5.6 billion gallons of highly contaminated wastewater as a result of fracking to be pumped through um, and on top of the processing capacity of these wastewater treatment plants. So, where are they putting it? My guess is right back into the ground. Surface water sources such as rivers, streams, and lakes, which will eventually end up in the air and bioaccumulate in plants, animals, and aquatic life, as well as persistently poisoning people in the region by way of exposure, inhalation, and or ingestion. I think you get the picture. Second, we'll look at the use of naturally occurring salt domes for the storage of volatile gas, oil, and a host of other hazardous materials. As I'm sure many of you are already aware of the sinkhole in Bayou Corn, which is the result of the collapse of a gas storage cavern leased by Texas Brine, located in the Napoleonville salt dome. The official position being taken by Texas Brine is that the integrity of the cavern was compromised due to a series of naturally occurring earthquakes in the area of the soil. Let's look at this explanation. We know from research that after the injection process of a fracking well ceases, the act of pumping in highly pressurized water and chemicals into the well bore that this is immediately followed by small quakes in the surrounding area. We know this because above each of these cavern storage facilities are localized seismic monitors to measure such activity. 
So it is arguable that the quakes Texas Brine alludes to are natural, but that they are the direct result of fracking activity in the area. Over 50 caverns have been borne out of the Napoleonville salt dome, leaving it with the appearance and the integrity of Swiss, Swiss cheese. What's, what exactly is being stored in these caverns? Well, first off, these caverns are not only used for storage, they are also used as disposal facilities for highly volatile organic contaminants such as chemical waste, military ordnance, and spent nuclear waste materials. These man-made and naturally occurring soft salt caverns provide storage for light hydrocarbons such as propane, butane, ethane, ethylene, natural gas, and oil and gas, which are otherwise referred to as strategic petroleum reserves, or SPRs. These are also used to store other products coming from refineries and na the natural gas extraction that are transported and stored as liquids. So how much of this combustible gas and liquids is being stored? in these caverns in Louisiana. According to a report put out by the EIA, or Energy Information Administration for 2007 to 2008, this capacity stood at 48 billion cubic feet. And you can bet, with the increase in fracking leases, that number is much higher today. So, why use salt domes? Quite simply, because it's cheap, and profit is the name of the game. In addition, after these caverns are borne out, the salt itself provides a self-sealing type of containment vessel. Salt domes have an unstable tensile strength baseline, and it is affected adversely by increases in temperature, and the USGS, as well as was well aware of this, as were the oil drilling companies and industries in 1983. Drilling injection and extraction from, um, from these formations generates heat, lots of it, up to 140 degrees Celsius in the storage cavern. Also, the rock-like salt material comprising these domes and caverns have a brittle aspect to them in that they can perform under vertical pressure under normal conditions, but they are less likely to hold up under horizontal pressures such as earthquakes, thus losing structural integrity. Kind of like taking a piece of Kohler shale, if you try and squeeze it or bend break it, it's hard as a rock, but if you strike it in a certain way, it shatters. The practice of boring out storage caverns combined with regional fracking has led to the degradation of the Napoleonville salt dome. And I think we can accurately conclude that this is the primary cause of the Bayou Corn sinkhole. Further degradation of other storage caverns in other salt domes is probably imminent given the regional disturbance of the underlying geology in that area by drilling, extraction, and storage methods we've discussed, which have led to increased seismic activity. Now, the Permian Basin of West Texas and southeastern New Mexico, where the WIP site sits right in the middle of, is one of the major petroleum-producing regions of the United States. This basin produced 3% of the world's petroleum in 1984, and in that year, 1% of the world's proven reserves were in the Permian Basin. Regarding the geological infrastructure 
of the land where the whip site sits. It was well known in 1990, prior to the 1999 opening of the whip site, that earlier core samples displayed halite cements, halite fracture fillings, and even halite pseudomorphs of fossil fragments. These diagenetic forms of halite generally correspond to the distribution of halite in the overlying salt plant pan, reflecting brine infiltration. So the infiltration of brine into the underlying geological structure was well known, and this in fact would not have been, could not have been, a dry storage facility. And in these diagrams here of the bore segments taken out, you, it's quite evident of the structural cracks in the underlying sediment, as we see here. Fractures in the sediment of the underlying structure of the geology in that area that can be seen with the eye, as well as displayed by these dotted lines here, those fractures that are not necessarily evident by the naked eye. In an analysis paper put out by EnviroLeaks back in January of 2011, they go on to cite yet another factor which goes to making WIP a very undesirable location <clears throat> to be storing nuclear waste. And that goes to Project Gnome, which was the first nuclear test in the Plowshare program. <clears throat> Project Gnome involved the detonation of a three kiloton device underground in the salt beds in the Carlsbad and surrounding areas. The analysis goes on to say that it in addition to underground nuclear testing at Carlsbad and the geological instability that those tests have caused, you then consider taking into account other activity occurring around the WIP area, such as the legacy of the underground blast caverns, numerous active and abandoned mines in the area, abandoned drill sites, and a host of high pressure water injection points for increasing the availability of oil and hundreds of oil and gas wells. And I believe that count was 2,500, many of which are within a stone's throw of the WIP facility. And this diagram here shows you some of the mining activity going on in the WIP area, which when I was down there, I did pass the Intrepid East mine and the North Shaft Intrepid East Mine. So WIP is like right in this area, right here, right about here or somewhere. Bearing in mind the image you just saw, now consider the many academic papers and government documents that paint nothing but a rosy picture for the future of WIP. Yet there are two glaring problems here. First, Consider just the complexity of the intrusions and caverns in the images that you saw previously. Now augment them with this map that shows a layout of gas, oil, and oil and gas producing wells, as well as dry holes and injection sites. In a 1997 DOE document entitled Waste Isolation Plant Disposal Phase, Final Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement, one thing stands out with reference to oil and gas is the description of a situation that seems out of control. In this expert excerpt here, it says, according to a study of comprehensive well records for nine townships around the WIP site, 532 wells have been drilled in search of oil and gas by the end of 1993. Between 1960 and 1989, drilling activity increased but was sporadic and never exceeded 20 wells per year. 
Since 1990, however, drilling has increased markedly, uh, with annual totals increasing to a maximum of 140 wells in 1993. And I can assure you there is a lot more activity going on today. This increase has been partially attributable attributable to the opening of previously restricted areas of the potash area to drilling. And that potash mine sits right off to the west of Whip Road. Most of these wells were drilled into the Brushy Canyon formation of the Delaware Mountain Group. The point is, is that not only is there great complexity in the Whip area, but there is also a high level of activity, oil and gas drilling, salt injection, and underground mining, to name a few. And if you recall, in Whipgate 3, I think it was, where Sandia National Labs, in their PowerPoint presentation, which there is a link to in that video, shows all the warnings, placards, granite markers, and monuments that absolutely unequivocally state do not drill or dig in this area. In a segment, in a previous segment of Whipgate, I cited a paper by Dr. Snow from University of California, Berkeley, who goes on to say that the preponderance of evidence supports the contention that PA modeling certainly underestimates releases of radioactivity to the accessible environment. This is reason enough for invalidating the certification granted by the EPA. Given its departures from rationality, the reader should be incredulous that the DOA application was approved. The EPA was well aware that the basis for objections both then and now has always been that there are karst conditions in the rustler. <clears throat> and that's a section of the Great Permian Basin for those who are unfamiliar. The transuranic waste has to be removed from generator sites even if an adequate permanent repository has not been established. Transuranic waste disposal underground remains premature, leaving monitored retrievable storage as the only option. A safe temporary facility could be situated near the surface of an old, stable landform above the water table. For instance, at WIP, it could probably be established on the Santa Rosa Formation, but not on the Dewey Lake Rustler Karstland. It is evident that the disposal in salt at WIP is not the answer, where travel times in the overlying aquifer will be in orders of magnitude shorter than the PA predicted. The EPA has erred in certifying the repository and recertifying it in 2003 should be defeated. Well, as we all know, it's 2014 and that site is still operating, so evidently that recertification was never defeated or even challenged. Meanwhile, transuranic waste disposal at WIP should stop and the waste already in place in the first panel should be retrieved before the roof a roof collapse makes it prohibitively costly and dangerous to do so. The geological fragility of the entire region encompassing Loving, Carlsbad, Hobbs, and Artesia is being further compromised by drilling and fracking in this area. Sinkholes are popping up all over the place and are being blamed on the intensive drilling in the region. The area is a ticking time bomb and the WIP officials and your elected politicians were warned about this, yet they went ahead with designating this area for the WIP project anyway. <laughs>